Good afternoon, my name is Tony Wood. I am the Program Director for Energy and Climate Change at Grattan Institute. Welcome to this one hour webinar, and we're going to be talking about the future of gas in Australia, specifically in Victoria, because it has some really interesting lessons for the rest of the country. Um, the intention this afternoon is basically to try and be provide an explainer and a um, information session. We're not we may very well in the Q&A's discussion get into issues of, um, let's call them political sensitivities, but we're not out to nail anybody or have a go at anybody. I think the important issue is to help people broadly better understand what's going on and to use the knowledge and experience of the panellists this afternoon to explore those issues. Um, firstly, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of, the, uh, of, of Australia. Um, I'm speaking to you from Darwin, which is the, the traditional owners there of the Larrakia people. But, and the other panellists, uh, uh, Alison Reeve, who's the uh, Deputy Program Director for the Grant Institute, is joining us from Canberra, and Ralph Griffith and Matthew Cremar from, um, uh, Math, sorry, Ralph is from the Victorian Government, and Matthew is um, from the Australian Energy Market Operator. So uh, what we'll be doing uh, is for the first next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the issues um, and draw upon the experience and knowledge of the three panellists. And then we'll spend the second half of this uh, webinar answering questions. I'll let you know now that um, a number of you have registered for this webinar and already submitted questions, and I've got that list, and we can delve into those, and there will we will do. But equally, uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can post a question there. If someone's already posted a question, then you can vote for that question, and that will push it up to the top of the order, which means it's most, it's most likely a very tricky question. We'll avoid all those that go to the top straight away, of course. Um, so without more ado, um, let me get into this. Um, now, we're very fortunate to have uh, both Matthew and Ralph here because they do bring quite different perspectives to the issue. Uh, the Australian Energy Market Operator, um, one of the, they, they basically have responsibilities for planning and operating the physical system, making sure we have reliability, not just every day, but into the future. And to do that, one of the things that they do is periodically publish what's called a statement of opportunities for electricity and one for gas. And this is intended to be what I just said. That is, it identifies that as best we can see it today, and we look down the track, but on the best assumptions we've got, what are things looking like gonna happen in terms of basically supply and demand for electricity or supply and demand for gas? And the two are related, but this afternoon we're talking primarily about gas. And now the last, the last report published by the Australian Energy Market Operator, the Gas Statement of Opportunities, um, I think has some very interesting lessons there. Ralph Griffith, on the other hand, Ralph works with the, the Victorian government, and one of the challenges that Ralph's been working through is how does, um, how does all this play out for Victoria? And we'll come to that. Um, and Alison Reeve, who's the Deputy Program Director of the Grant Institute, has been working with me for the last 12 months or so. Um, and Alison will talk a little bit about um, how we see some of the policy issues that this brings to light in relation to energy policy. So that's the that's the content and the people. Um, so Andrew, uh, sorry, Matthew, um, let me start with you. Um, when I read the, the statement of opportunities, I guess I was struck by the fact that on one set of assumptions, we could easily within 12 months by the middle of next year be faced with a um, potential, I guess, shortfall in Victoria. Um, but then after that, if things go reasonably according to plan, that should things should improve. And we might not see a problem there until probably another, maybe into the early 2030s, when life gets even more complicated because the assumptions about what's going on become a little harder. So would you like to just maybe outline how AEMO sees that those sort of possible futures, recognising this, is, this isn't about forecasting, it's about helping to think about um, what the gas looks like. Because it seems to me that this version of the statement of opportunities opens up some issues that are a bit more sharply defined than we've seen probably in the last several years. Yeah, um, thank you, Tony, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, look, with the gas statement of opportunities and also the Victorian gas planning report, um, look, we've, we've tried to articulate uh, a, a couple of scenarios and, and really the key word uh, in these reports is uncertainty. Um, you know, the, the, the pace of change um, uh, in the NEM uh, and then how that's sort of playing through to gas and what we could expect to see in terms of decarbonisation um, of, of the gas sector and, and the shift away from gas, um, you know, when that, you know, when 
when that could occur and how soon that would occur and 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 you know what what is the uh, um, you know the breakdown of the, the, the those customer transitions. So you do have what we've called the step change um, scenario where you you are sort of seeing uh, a, a quite a, a fast reduction um, in in gas uh, consumption. Um, and, and that's sort of uh, in line with the sort of hypothesis in the uh, gas substitution roadmap. Um, uh, and then you see more of a progressive change where the, that, that move away from gas is, is, is slower. Um, and look, part of the other thing you'll see is that, you know, the, the assumption of whether it's going, how much that gas reduction is going to be, you know, commercial, industrial, um, you know, electrifying or reducing their gas consumption, how much of that's residential. Um, one of the key points, though, is that, you know, the, these are sort of annual consumption numbers, shall we say. And one of the key points we're sort of uh, highlighting is particularly with uh, um, gas, gas power generation, um, what we're seeing is potentially very high variability um, forecasts in future of how much gas is needed to support um, uh, power generation on only you know a handful of days per month, and um, so it really comes into a, a capacity discussion for gas supply versus annual quantities, and so that sort of plays back into the importance of you know um, storages, um, you know, and and having you know sufficient pipeline capacity. Um, that's able to support that that peaking capacity, um, but you know also you know not sort of um, overbuilding the system um, because you know I mean you get into things like you know West East pipelines from uh, Western Australia is you know you, you don't need the gas all year round you only you know you need peaks um, and and that's part of the challenge is supporting peaks. Yeah, Tony, you've muted yourself. Thank you very much. I did, for the purposes of the people on the session, I did warn the other panellists this would happen, and I, you know, I said I'd probably do it myself, and just to prove it, I did. Um, look, I think it sets out as, as much as anything the, the very important challenges and questions we've got, because um, in the past when a lot of things going on in gas and electricity were once big investment decisions were made, then the future was more or less laid out for the next 30 or 40 years. Um, this is now looking far more uncertain. And so I guess it's uncertainty that's framing a lot of what you were just talking about, Matthew. And I think that um, that's what's worth exploring because um, I don't think anyone's got is the founder of all wisdom here, but understanding, well, what are the choices that we might have to make and who might make those choices and under what circumstances might they make different choices? Then I think that becomes part of an interesting discussion rather than sort of saying, well, here's the answer. Why don't we just all do it? Because I don't think... The answer, if the answer was that simple, we would have done it already. Um, we'd, be, we'd be thinking about this. Um, we wouldn't even be thinking about this. We're doing other stuff with our day. But that's where we are. Um, so, look, Ralph, why don't we switch to the Victorian situation? And the reason we've suggested been this, when we were talking about setting up this session a while ago was to say, well, look, when you look around Australia, um, in, in the nature of the challenge that Matthew's been talking about, it, in some ways it crystallises in Victoria more sharply than it does in other places. Victoria traditionally was a, uh, a state that benefited enormously from natural gas in the, which arrived very late 1960s, early 1970s, and underpinned a lot of um, activity in the, in, the, in the state, not only for um, commercial uses of that natural gas, but also for home heating and home cooking and all those sorts of things. That's been an enormously useful in that perspective. But of course, A, we're running out of gas, and B, we've got some other challenges. So Victoria, um, doesn't have, uh, as far as we know, the resources of natural gas that other parts of the country like Queensland and Western Australia have. Um, there are various constraints around the development of onshore unconventional gas in Australia, coal seam gas, for example, in Victoria, I mean, and that creates some interesting challenges. Ralph, can you talk a little bit about um, what, you know, when we look at the, the, the statement of opportunities for the country and the specific report that uh, AMO did for Victoria, how are the government's thinking about balancing demand and supply, given it sounds like we've got potentially a nasty short-term problem that are somewhat different longer-term problem? Yes, and I will echo a lot of what you've just, you've just said and Matt said, because I think the problem is, is pretty clear and it's, it's really important. I mean, gas sector, natural gas sector in, in Victoria's 
facing challenges across supply, pricing, and, and also emissions. I mean, you mentioned you know, investments 30, 40 years. Um, you know, many people are, are reasonably well committed now to net zero by 2050. That's only 28 years, you know, whatever the trajectory is, that's not there. So as you say, transitions, you know, particularly important to Victoria, where, where over 2 million customers rely upon reliable and affordable gas. We've got, you know, we've been really well served by, by legacy fields that have, have historically supplied abundant low-cost natural gas to Victoria, but they are depleting. Um, and as Matt identified, the, the AMO's forecasts identify decline in production um, over the next few years with possible impacts on peak day supply capacity, um, energy affordability and reliability are obviously a top priority for the government, the Victorian government. And so you need investment in that world. Additionally, Victoria has also set ambitious emissions reductions targets with targets achieving reductions of 28 to 33% by 2025 and 45 to 50% by 2030 on a path to net zero in 2050. And um, for those interested, the um, consultation is actually underway right now on, on targets for 2035 as an independent panel chaired by Martin Wilder with Emma Hurd and and tenant read and um, consultation was, uh, is open now on Engage Victoria till um, middle of May. There aren't subsector targets in that. There's no specific target to any particular part of the economy. They're economy wide, but clearly in the gas sector, which contributes about 17% of Victoria's emissions now, will have some role to play. Um, you know, exactly whether it's proportional, greater than proportional, less than proportional is, is much trickier question that would take time to work through. Um, using less natural gas though, through energy efficiency and electrification now does offer some opportunities to cut customers' bills and importantly free up natural gas for industrial and other hard, use, hard other uses that are really hard to electrify now. Um, additionally, you know, bring up gas, natural gas with the introduction of renewable gases, um, hydrogen, biomethane, et cetera, also has an effect and can have a long-term role in providing a gaseous fuel for industries into the future, but that will take time to build up. So, you know, in the, in the short term, the, the really short-term actions that are here and on the table and um, cost-effective are around energy efficiency and electrification in readily um, substitutable areas. In many cases, that will save customers' bills immediately um, and, and really also disconnect them from the vagaries of gas pricing now we're connected to the international market. So there's that, that side. Um, there's also potential for reducing some of the barriers after 50 or 60 years of abundant low-cost gas, uh, time planning, building codes, various things are all actually um, tilted towards pushing customers' choice to gas over electricity because historically gas was cheaper and cleaner. Um, that's no longer the case in Victoria and some of those, some of those rules may not make as much sense as they, they once did. There's obviously you know, a no regrets case for you know, preparing for the uptake of, of renewable gases at, at scale. Um, you know, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen you know, clearly has a a journey to go on to get there, but there's great promise. Um, there are uses in the system that require a gaseous fuel uh, and, you know, essentially the, re the uh, renewable hydrogen industry development plan really sets out the government's um, intent in that space to build a hydrogen industry and capture those new jobs. On the reliability side, you know, it, I think that, that deserves its own focus and really, you know, the first thing that we had to that I think is really important is to secure that investment um, necessary. You know, the system goes from having, you know, one big large supplier in the east that can basically meet everything to a much more diversified system that we've got to move to the west, we've got to get gas from east, west to north, south, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of investment required there and we've got to, you know, focus on the what's it, western orbital ring main and the southwest pipeline and um, APAs. You know, recently announced that it's committed to 
an expansion of the southwest pipe, which will help with that. The, the worm is, is well underway and, and should be developed in time. It's also new supply and um, you know, that notwithstanding the declining fields, it, Exxon is investing in that in that area and has um, put on new capacity and committed to new capacity. Um, you know, around about the beginning of this year, they announced that. And um, yesterday, or possibly earlier this week, um, the Department of DJPR announced that uh, Beach Energy has been granted a production license for, for the production in the, well, to move to production in the in the west of Victoria. So there's new supply, moving supply around. LNG um, import could have a, a big role in that. Again, that's another one of those uncertainties Matt um, identified. You know, six months ago, there were, we, I mean, we have really good proponents looking at that. But, you know, with <coughs> what's happening in Europe, there's, there's some thoughts that maybe that, that will be a bit harder to secure in the, in the short term. But it has a great advantage of being able to bring in flexible gas supplies on demand as needed. And then depending on how the path to, to net zero um, plays out, those in, investments in the FFS. Uh, you can move to other locations as as needed. So, yeah, I think mean, we'll stop there. We're trying to get that balance of investment into this uncertain market whilst it's transitioning, really on a path that you know electricity's probably been going down for twenty years and is now a part place for the gas yeah. the gas industry to go. And I think um, you know with, with that the next bit that I'd like to touch upon with Alison is. Um, but when you look at this tricky situation where uh, we don't want to run out of gas, there are a lot of valuable things that a gas is used, and some of them, because the alternatives are quite challenging, may still be a while around for a little while yet. And yet we've got this now universal, I mean, apart from maybe Matt Canavan, from what I've seen in the media today, um, commitment to net zero by 2050. Um, so these seems to be sort of slightly out of step. Um, that we've got this commitment to net zero, gas is a fossil fuel, you would think we've got to stop burning it by 2050, and yet um, we're also not particularly keen about running out of gas to heat our homes and cook our food, et cetera, and in some cases, some of those important industrial activities. Alison, can you talk a little bit about uh, how Grattan, the work we've done, and some of it both, both before and you joined Grattan, about how governments really might be thinking about or should be thinking about, maybe from our perspective, we're more than happy to tell governments what to do, um, how they should be thinking about trying to align these two challenges because they do seem to be quite out of step with each other. Yeah, I mean, I think like Ralph said, you've kind of got these, you know, you've got sort of short-term uncertainty where, you know, gas might go up, it might stay stable, it might go down, but then in, you've got this sort of long-term uncertainty as well about whether you're going to completely wind down gas networks or whether you're going to repurpose them. And so governments are sort of trying to, I think, solve for both things at the same time. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that uncertainty comes because we don't necessarily know what all of the solutions are yet. So it's really hard to say we have to go there. Um, but I think what governments can do is kind of narrow the range of possibilities and also kind of not do things that we're going to regret later. Um, one of the things I think is quite important, and I think this was sort of raised in the, the chat a little bit, is to avoid locking in patterns of energy use that prolong using gas. Um, and that's not just about investing in new gas infrastructure. Um, so, you know, for example, the federal government has been spending some money to boost the development of gas pipelines. Um, you need to be very careful about that, particularly if that infrastructure has a long life and is going to need to be used for a long time in order to recoup the capital. Um, the other part of it, though, is to be careful about regulatory nudges. Um, so things like requiring gas connections into new homes, for example, um, is something that you probably shouldn't do because once you lock in a pattern of energy use, it can be really hard to get rid of it again. And often the only way to do that is then to subsidise people to change. The other thing I think um, is important, and I think um, Matthew raised this as well, is valuing the role that gas can play in the electricity market. And some governments, I think, not necessarily Victoria, but some other ones are kind of stuck in this old way of talking about gas as a transition fuel, as if it's going to be the bridge between we're going to switch from coal to gas and then gas to renewables. 
what we're actually seeing play out is that gas is the residual fuel. It's um, renewables can or will do most things in electricity, um, but gas is sort of needed for the very residual bit that as yet we don't know how to do. Um, and I think in our report last year, Go for Net Zero, we demonstrated this quite, quite nicely that you could get to somewhere around 90% renewables in the electricity market at you know fairly low cost, but getting that last 10% was really hard. So setting up the energy market to properly value the role that gas is going to play would also, I think, helps to narrow the range of future possibilities, which then makes it easier for people to plan. I mean, if I had to sum up what we keep asking governments to do, it's just sort of like, could you please have a plan? Could you, you know, please come to this and open the discussion about the fact that gas will not be there one day and think about how we get there in um, a, a way that's not disruptive for people? And I think the, I guess one thing I should, should add to this, a little bit is um, that um, some years ago now, when I first got involved in the energy industry, um, for my sins, I ended up being the Australian president of the Australian LP Gas Association. And one of the discussions we had strategically was how the hell did we end up in a situation where we've got this stuff called liquefied petroleum gas, and we're having to compete with this other stuff called natural gas. And how do we get caught up in such a, a terrible marketing loss? I and mean, how do those bastards get away with calling it natural gas when, you know, in many cases, it's coming from the same bloody place? Um, I don't think Scott Morrison called it natural coal when he carried a piece of it into Parliament House. So, you know, it's an interesting scenario where um, in the past it's been predominantly, I mean, we moved, you know, we've had gas in Australia for now almost for over 200 years. And for the first 100 years, it was gas made from coal, uh, called Towns Gas or Coal Gas. It was actually, um, if you're really interested, it was a really great way of uh, committing suicide. Um, in fact, when they stopped using um, that manufactured gas from coal in the UK, uh, within five years, the suicide rate dropped by a third um, because people, the number of people who committed suicide by turning turning on the, um, the gas burners in the oven and closing it, closing the room up was pretty scary. Um, it's much harder to do that with natural gas. So maybe that's one of the advantages of natural gas. Um, so I think that we do adopt natural gas and it has had enormous benefit. But of course, now we're facing a different future. Ralph, one of the just a couple of questions of information that I think might be interesting is that to help you understand where things are right at now is that um, not just in Victoria, but other states at various times have had mechanisms by which governments have supported the expansion of the natural gas network um, to get it to develop for regional, regional Australia. I mean, the cities had, as I said, had, had coal gas, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane for many, many years, and it wasn't very difficult to basically put um, methane or what's called natural gas through those pipelines to replace the coal gas. But of course, many parts of the country didn't have that. And so when they shut down their own local um, coal gas manufacturing plants, the answer was why don't we just get gas pipelines into those regions. Can you just update where, is the, as Victoria is grappling with these interesting questions, where does the state sit in relation now to any ongoing support or otherwise for the continuing expansion of the gas network? It's, uh, so certainly it has had, and, and there have been um, gas for the regions programs various times, even up till possibly 2010-ish. Um, I don't think there's any um, underway now, but if, it, if it's more to do with the, you know, gas networks themselves expanding, and I think the, the, the nudge that, that Alison was talking about that is there is still a, a bit of a nudge in the building code and the um, and the planning provisions though they're not they're not they don't they don't push people to have to go at us. Um, and you know in many ways that is a, that is a real question now for the economics with the regulator of the the gas network. You know what is a was an incremental expansion of the gas network that is you know beneficial to all the other customers very quickly versus you know investments in, in in new connections that might take decades to pay off and may actually be a liability for other for other customers rather than necessarily a specific for the government at this stage to determine whether or not you know developers or new suburbs or things will have um, you know, have gas on it's, it's it's it is very important though that you're able to make that customers are able to make those choices um, with with knowledge and, and understanding and and you know, not be forced to make a connection that 
that locks them in. And I think I saw Tristan Hodes write a piece on this the other day. I mean, I think we were all thinking gas was the right thing to lock in, you know, by 10, 15 years ago. And then, you know, it may well be in 10 or 15 years with really low cost um, green gas or it, or it may not be. So I believe we've got to give people information, make those choices, developers, et cetera. But certainly today there's real opportunities if you're building um, new that you're probably better off not. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things that, you know, unless people have read the report, Gas Statement of Opportunities, Matt, that um, I think intrigued me was that, you know, the set of scenario, the set of assumptions that would lead potentially to even gas shortages in Victoria, let alone maybe other parts of Southeast Australia, um, within the next 12 months or so, in the middle of next winter. Now, you, highly, you talk, talked a little bit about the nature of the way gas is used, um, particularly in the Southeast in winter. Can you talk a little bit about the circumstances that might or might not uh, would determine whether or not we actually could lead to, uh, we could end up with a gas shortage in Victoria next year and um, either you or Ralph might, well, what the hell are we, gonna, are we doing about that? What, what are the choices we might have that would ensure that we don't have people running out of gas in the middle of winter? Yeah, um, good question, Tony. Because um, I, I think, you know, we talk about, oh, we're going to run out of gas. Um, and then as, as Ralph uh, highlighted, there is gas projects coming on. So what do we mean by running out of gas, right? And, and really the issue is um, it's a capacity issue, right? Um, you know, in the middle of summer, when there's no gas-fired generation on, <clears throat> we're only using 250 terajoules a day of gas. Um, 9th of August 2019, we used 1,308 TJs. Um, so it's that variability um, of, of, of the gas supply and demand that is the problem. And what we're seeing is um, the, the forecast um, decline in Longford capacity. So, you know, if you think right back 50 years ago, um, you know, Marlin, uh, Barracuda and Snapper, the big fields at, at, at Longford, they were developed, you know, gas and fuel, lots of gas, you know, uh, cheap gas. Those fields are depleting or already gone. Um, and, um, you know, what, was, what, what basically we've spelled out fairly, uh, you know, in the, in the VG power is you, you're, you're, you're losing that capacity, um, that flexible capacity um, during the winter. There's still plenty of gas, but you, you, you know, you're potentially down at sort of only eight or 900 TJs a day of, of, of gas production capacity. Um, and, and then the rest is coming from storages. And you need to have sufficient pipelines um, to deliver that gas either from Queensland. So our modelling assumes that the, you know, based on the information provided by APA, that, you know, the, the pipeline is only going to be able to provide a certain amount from Queensland. And we can only get a certain amount of gas out of, out of Port Campbell. Um, so we've got storage expanding. Um, you've got, um, you know, with the Enterprise Gas, you've got the Otway Gas Plant returning back to sort of potentially its full capacity. Um, so, you know, as, as, as Ralph mentioned, you know, expanding the Southwest Pipeline provides a bit more capacity for peaking to supply that winter load. Um, and what we've got the problem is, you know, okay, we've got a, you know, a, a move towards electrification, decarbonisation. Problem is the sort of rugs being pulled out from us and, uh, you know, the, the gas supply is uh, falling away faster than, you know, we can electrify out of it. Um, and, you know, that sort of comes into the step change scenario a bit where, you know, you know, you, you can potentially start, um, you know, electrifying a, a de, you know degree of heating. You know, um, you know some of the new dwellings are, are not putting in gas heating. You know, they're, they're still a new connection. They've still got gas hot water and gas cooktop, but then they've just got they do have just heat pumps. You know, so air conditioning and um, um, and, and and electric heating. So you know there is some of that occurring, but then. You know, there's obviously other new builds that are you know potentially still putting in the you know, you know the, the conventional gas ducted heating. So, you know, you know that that's sort of really coming back to what Ralph is saying. But really, probably wanted to take that opportunity to say it, it, it's a very seasonal issue. And I think we're, before the call, Tony, we we're talking about that. You know, in Victoria during the summer and, and shoulder season, we use 10 petajoules a month of gas um, in Victoria. But during the winter, we use 25 to 30 petajoules a month of gas. So that's that's even just on a monthly consumption to go with that daily consumption numbers are talking about. So, 
you, you've, you've got to, if, if you're going to electrify that extra 15 to 20 petajoules of gas that's used, you know, for heating in Victoria, you know, if that's going to come from electricity, you, you know, you have to build out, you know, that electrical infrastructure to support that. Um, but then you also need to work out what you're going to do for all that electrical infrastructure during the summer uh, when it's, it's not needed, right? And it's like, well, you know, you're going to make hydrogen out of it. You support hydrogen export industry. You know, uh, you know that, that's sort of part of the thing grappling with. And, and that's really where Alison was going a little bit of, of you know, not wanting to um, take a path that you're going to regret, you know, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you know, hydrogen reticulation to everybody's home is, is going to be the answer, but, you know, you, you do potentially have infrastructure which might help you get there in terms of gas blending for some of the, you know, as, as Ralph was saying, with hydrogen blending or biomethane. So, you know, really comes back to the uncertainty in terms of economics because hydrogen is still really damned expensive, but, you know, it might help displace um, diesel sooner um, for some of the heavy vehicles. So, yeah, that's really what I want to touch on is where the where the shortage is and 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 what we're sort of talking about, and it's just those those peak winter days and that winter monthly consumption is the is the problem. I guess it's when you had when the gas was on the doorstep in the uh, offshore Victoria, it wasn't such a big deal, and uh, that's all changed, obviously. Mm. Also, just uh, before we open up to the questions that have been already submitted both online and um, previous to the session, um, yeah. You know, we said we've got we're making enormous progress in the electricity sector across Australia and emissions coming down. Right? I mean, broadly speaking, I mean prices are pretty volatile at the moment because of what's going on in other parts of the world mainly, but also because we've had some pretty nasty weather which has affected coal supply and so on within Australia. Um, broadly speaking, um, prices have been broadly lower than they've been for a long time. Um, Reliability has been fine, uh, and emissions are coming down. So electricity, on the one hand, looks to be going okay, but as even though electricity remains something like a third of our, maybe it's a bit less now, of our total emissions. But as we try and move towards net zero by 2050, the other sectors start to matter. And as you know, Ralph mentioned, for Victoria, it's about 17% of our emissions associated with gas. I think nationally, it's a bit higher than that because there's some very big industrial emitters in some of the other states. I mean, what do we, we've got, we've got policies, most of them are state-based policies to change the mix of renewable energy, and that obviously helps reduce emissions. But we don't have anything like that for gas, and yet gas is clearly a significant contributor. So as, as the, you know, the work that we've done in Grattan um, has talked about the, the, what happens in the, in the sector, which is so critical, if we're going to have net zero by 2050, what do you think the policy choices are that governments are going to have to grapple with, um, whether it's in the next term of government or after? Because at some point, we're going to have to think about bending the curve on on these gas emissions, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at the federal government's emissions projections for the coming decade, you can see the, the electricity line goes down like this and pretty much everything else sits fairly flat. It hardly changes. There's, um, you know, and that is largely reflecting that there aren't strong policies in place in the way that there are in electricity to drive the emission reductions in those sectors. Um, and so, I mean, governments need to get started on that now. And some of that is because of the lock-in problem that I talked, I talked about before as well, that we've got, you know, we've got industrial gas user, users who are going to face large capital replacement decisions this decade. And if they decide to stick with gas, um, then we're locking in that gas use for another 20 to 30 years. And that makes it harder to get to net zero. Um, I mean, I, I think the thing that we've, yeah, I think that the thing is, though, that there's a lot of options to reduce the amount of emissions that you've got coming from gas, right? I mean, Ralph talked about efficiency, which is actually often the, um, it's the, the the poor cousin, but it is actually really important. Um, the other thing is, uh, is switching over to electrification. Now, there are a lot of gas uses that you can do better and cheaper with electricity. Um, so low temperature heat, say for um, food processing, for example, um, low temperature heat within your own home. Um, there are some things where it's actually really hard. And that's because either you need high temperature heat um, or you need the gas as a feedstock. You're after the molecules, not the embodied energy in it. The other thing which I think we haven't talked a lot about um, is the gas 
um, that's consumed in the LNG industry. A lot of people don't know that Australia's single biggest consumer of gas is actually the LNG industry burning its own gas in order to um, get the energy to compress gas and, and put it onto ships and export it. What happens to LNG exports in um, a world where the rest of the world goes for net zero? And, you know, I think one of the things we're sort of seeing with, with, with the Ukraine situation is people are talking seriously about reducing their reliance on gas altogether. What happens with that is also a fairly large um, unknown and, and swing factor. The thing really that governments need to do policy-wise is to get the policies in place to do the stuff where we know the solution already. We don't need to worry about having a solution for every single gas user right now. We have got 20 to 30 years to do this. But if you do put policies in place, like, for example, um, the energy efficiency schemes that exist in New South Wales and Victoria, you know, those potentially could be tweaked to help you know, switch from gas to electricity. Um, if you do things at the federal level, like squeezing down the safeguard, what's called the safeguard mechanism, people may have seen a fair bit of um, sound and light in the media about that today. Um, but ultimately what that does is asks industrial users to reduce their emissions. And one of the ways they can do that is by being more efficient with the gas they use or by switching away from gas to something else. There are lots of things that we can do and we should start doing those things now. Indeed. Um, so let's get into some of the, we touched upon some of the things we've already raised have been questions that have been submitted both before this webinar and after we started. Um, there are quite a few questions about um, effective, I guess, alternative gases. Um, one of them is biogas, the other one probably the much more uh, either hyped or whatever you want to call it, the issue is hydrogen. Um, and um, in fact, I was just uh, for my sins, just reading a book by Saul Griffin, I don't think he's related to you, Ralph, um, called The Big Switch. And this is basically electrify everything. And he's got one section which basically says hydrogen is a dumb way of doing it. Now, I just want to just explore a little bit um, the challenge here because, you know, on the one hand, we do have, uh, and we've already once before redeployed a gas network which was built for coal gas and was converted to methane. Um, we could go back and re put hydrogen through that same gas network. I mean, it would be a different, it wouldn't be hydrogen and carbon monoxide as the old coal gas used to be. It would be probably um, largely a very hot, maybe potentially even 100% hydrogen. There'd be things you'd have to do, costs involved. Um, and the hydrogen, as you said earlier, I think that is still right now quite expensive, but you'd still be able to use the assets. So you might have to do some engineering on some parts of that gas system, all to be thought through, right? Um, the alternative is to take the Saul Griffith approach and electrify the whole bloody thing. Just putting aside for a minute those areas which are probably difficult to electrify. But if you want to look at the ones that are, even then you've got huge uh, capital investment to make because every, every home, small business that uses gas, you'd have to change, um, you'd have to change, whichever way you go, you either change them to electricity or you change them to burn hydrogen. Um, if you've got to get hydrogen, you've got to build a hydrogen system to be able to make the hydrogen and get into the into the gas network. And then finally, um, if you don't go hydrogen, you're left with, well, what the hell do we do with these assets? There's probably across the country, you know, tens of billions of dollars worth of, of assets here. Um, broadly speaking, um, the way that industry has been structured is around what's called a regulated monopoly business. That is, it's a, effectively a social contract. It says those businesses get uh, are entitled to earn a relatively low return because they don't have to take market risk because we are going to pay them for that network that they've built or are maintaining for our use. But then we're going to say, no, well, one alternative is to, get, is, to get, is to stop using it. How do you deal with that? How do you turn off a gas network? Um, so I guess there's almost like there's these two big choices here and we can only put it off for so long. So how do we, how do you, what are the, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we could answer this in the next 10 minutes, but what do you think the issues are that need to be thought through if we're not going to look back in, you know, take Alison's time frame of even 20 to 30 years and say, well, we buggered that up, didn't we? Um, how do we avoid that, Ralph? How, how, are you, how are you thinking about this is what the answer is? I know you're working on the gas substitution roadmap, but what, do you, what are the key issues you've got to grapple? We have to grapple, not just you, but we have, we have to grapple with. You just articulated them all, to be honest. 
I mean, that the, and I, I think Arsenal saying, and the organization, it's like do no regrets things makes a lot of sense. You know, if, if somebody is better off straight away doing something, then, then, then do that. So that there is, you know, elements of electrification and, and energy efficiency that sit there. Um, but the renewable gas, I, I mean, I, I get the, the point that there are sort of two sort of extremes of people, something that is no role, something that is massive role. You know, probably in reality there is somewhere in between exactly how that role works, whether it's in transmission, whether it's locally produced in distribution areas, et cetera, um, whether it's transport that it's primarily used for or long-term inter-seasonal storage for um, the generation. Yeah, these things are you know, really questions of economics and it will have to just evolve as we find out what the price curves are. In terms of the, you know, sunk asset base effectively, you know, sweating that is probably a very good thing to do and there's probably a whole range of decisions the owners and regulators and regulators can do around that to, you know, make sure we get the maximum value out of it over the next X years and 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 you know, essentially people are getting enough value out of it, they're happy to pay for it, and we're really prudently working out what to spend, um, what to spend additional money on so that, you know, we don't get to that question you, you were both sort of alluding to, to is there a point where the, um, where the owner has to take a, a right down? Well, I mean, it is, it is really, really tricky, but I think that there is enough time and there is enough value in the energy supply to people if we do it really prudently um, for that not to be an issue. I know the AR's got a regulatory and regulating in um, this uncertainty um, approach that will will help guide that. But you know, at, at one end of the extreme, if you know that you're not a monopoly asset if no one wants to use it. And so there's only so much that compact can do. And but I, I don't know. You will remember it was only a few years ago people were talking about that in electricity and then, hang on, no, they won't because we're talking about electrifying everything, um, including hydrogen. I mean, hydrogen is electrification. And, you know, it is electric storage, you know, delivered in a different way. You use renewable energy, you produce electricity, you produce it and you store it and use it another time. Um, I, I did want to just make one other comment about the, the that peak in, in winter. Can I Obviously, there is the, you know, you know, if people have a more energy efficient, so particularly that thermal insulation for households, you can really reduce that peak winter, man, just with the insulation and electrify, you know, using efficient heat pumps will reduce it. But it also raises another regulatory question. For a long period of time, we've essentially priced that swing in gas at free, you know. So the thin gas offers customers is use a huge amount of it in a short period of time and we won't charge you any premium for that at all. Whereas in electricity, because of the constraints, that has been priced in a lot more, not perfectly, but it has been a, a real issue. And so, you know, people perceive gas as, you know, you can have a hot shower all the time. Well, you could do that with electricity. You always have been able to do that. It's just that people have recognised that's an expensive thing to do. You know, so there was off-peak hot water, there was off-peak heating systems, whereas in gas, and you know, maybe the nature of what we had here is we basically said to people, no, that, that's fine. You can just use your gas heater three day, you know, three months, two, two months a year, and we're not going to charge a premium. So there's probably you know issues to do with it in, in that space as well, in terms of managing the peak, in terms of whether there's you know incentives for customers to you know essentially use their gas at different times, not that anyone's going to Tom, if you promise this thing, they're not going down that things. But, you know, just even, even the kind of information, do you need to set your gas heater to turn on at precisely 6 a.m. like every single other person and turn on again in the afternoon precisely at 4 p.m.? You know, if you're in a modern house, six star, and hopefully yeah. you're seven star, you can turn on your heating basically at any time and it will your house will stay warm. Indeed. So that was a bit well, of a ramble, but... No. Sorry, Matt, were you going to say something? No, 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 I was apologising. Oh, sorry. Digressing. Okay. Right, no, no, that's fine. Um, Matt, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dunkelflater. Um, 
you may or may not know what that means. It means yeah. the one, inter one uh, the interpretation I have is it means the dark doldrums. And what that means is when it's dark and cold and there's no wind blowing, and what are we going to do? And it comes to that point you made before about, well, one of the roles for gas is to provide the balancing capacity or when we get to relatively high levels of wind and solar. Right, right now, the um, you know we're probably around close to a third of our electricity generation coming from renewables, wind and solar mainly. Um, it varies dramatically by state. Um, New South Wales has got some very aggressive increases coming ahead of it. And, you know, the Commonwealth government's own numbers show that New South Wales will be 80% renewables by 2030 and the, uh, the national electricity market close to 70%. So as you get up to those percentages, it's all wind and solar, then you end up with um, what do you do about Google Flava? And there's not too many simple solutions. In our work last year, we said, well, right now, um, and many people have made the same comment that maybe gas looks to be the most economically sensible option, even if you had to offset the emissions from burning some gas. But even getting gas, if, if that's the only thing we're using gas for in 20 or 30 years' time, then even having a system that provides gas into a relatively small number of power stations, how do you pay for it? So do you think that's the, the right way to think about it in terms of that role for gas in the electricity system? Or is there, in, in your work at AEMO, are you thinking about other other ways of solving that, that sort of problem where, where gas could continue to be significant or otherwise? Uh, I, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the doldrums, um, you, know, you know, obviously for background, um, for part of my sins, uh, you know, we do operate the Victorian gas system, um, you know, APA's asset, we do operate it. And one of the things that actually concerns me most during winter now is those cold, still overcast days. Um, 3rd of August, 2017, um, it was nine degrees in Melbourne, heavy fog all day, no wind. Um, that was a challenging day. Um, you know, so, you know, and I'm actually more concerned about some of those days than when it's blowing a gale and, um, yeah, you know, lots of heating, but, you know, at least the, um, at least the wind generations, uh, you know, does, does prop up the system. So, you know, certainly what I worry about in terms of the operation system is, you know, has, has changed a little bit. Um, it, one of the things, you know, and again, our, 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 our um, AMOS chairman, um, you know, has sort of said this as, as well as, you know, 2050 net zero doesn't mean no natural gas, right? But obviously it's going to have to be a bait in anything that's being used and, you know, potentially some of it may be biomethane as well, right? Um, but, what you maybe end up having in, um, uh, you know, by 2050 is you you potentially have a couple of storage facilities. You have a high pressure gas backbone, and you'll you have a, a um, you know a bunch of gas peaking power stations that will run, uh, you know, a handful of days a year, you know, as, as as sort of last resort. And potentially gas is going to be what other solutions are going to be priced against, right? You go well, I can spend you know, well, at the moment it's, you know, 15 or $20 a gigajoule for gas plus, you know, pipeline charges and capacity charges because, you know, storing gas in storages isn't cheap either um, and you've got to pay for the infrastructure. But you go, well, you know, that's my alternative um, or I can build more pumped hydro, I can build more interconnectors, I can build more demand response. So, you know, it, 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 you know gas is going to be your... You, you know, in procurement speak, it's your batten, right? It's your best alternative. Um, um, so that, that's that's what we're sort of looking at. One of the things you were sort of talking a little bit before about, you know, what is the future of gas and the gas distribution networks? You know, I mean, the the, the I mean, I was I think Alison might have been had some involvement in that as well. But the gas distributors have act, in Victoria have actually um, started asking that question and started working through that the process that have included KPMG, um, you know, and looking at, well, you know, should they be trying to increase the write down of their networks while there's still load on it, um, accepting that, you know, there, there may be retirement or abandonment of sections of their network, right? So, you know, that, that that's one of the challenges that, that they're working through because, you know, and again, you before you get into death spiral, you probably want to make sure you you know you, you think 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 that through. But you know, you know that is you know the you know really the challenge at the moment is what is the future of the of of, of the gas distribution networks versus transmission, where 
you know, there will be a bit of a core network, which, are, you know, I, I, my view is that, you know, that, that will have a role for, for some time just to support, you know, even if, you know, the last cabs off the rank are, are, are gas fire generation and, you know, some fully abated, you know, gas, gas users. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that, that's still, you know, we're talking, you know, nearly 30 years still to 2050, right? And, but obviously we, you know, can't wait to, you know, a year before 2050 and then decide what we're doing. Mm. Well, I guess there's some, there are some uses for gas, which don't get talked about a lot, but there can be, they're relatively high volume of gas where they're for chemical feedstock or there where we read really high temperature heat and the solutions there are technically not obvious at all, or they're very expensive. And so they may, as you say, they may still be a backbone of some gas supply. I guess at the other end of the spectrum, Ralph, um, one of the questions that got quite a few votes in the online the question submissions was, um, what a household was thinking about this. now. It turns out you know, the same issue applies to a degree. I mean, Brisbane, I used to live in Brisbane. I had natural gas connected to my home, but I used it for cooking. I used, you know, the distribution part of the cost was 90%. The gas could have been, was, could have been free. It wouldn't have made much difference to my gas bill. Um, then, you know, other states uh, use more gas, Sydney and Adelaide, Canberra, and then, you know, Melbourne in particular, Victoria uses quite a lot. Um, how do consumers think about it? Is, is the government or is your work as you think about gas substitution, looked at the preparedness of consumers to um, take on this challenge because it's not like it's those dirty coal-fired generators who are causing the damage. It's uh, we in our homes and businesses who are burning gas, and we're being told we've got to stop it. Um, you know, how what's what sort of what do we know about how consumers more generally think about that question? I think a lot of people are doing work in, in that space. There's two million consumers and I suspect there's two million answers to that but it, at least you know reconciling a bunch of things that we've done and other people are, are pointing to us to the sources you know it's largely as you'd expect there's been a long period of gas being the, the low cost clean alternative and people have that in mind and um, it tends to be demographically you know the, the older you are the more certain you are that gas is the right answer the younger you are the more open you are to to other Alternatives, I see uh, many of the networks are doing this with their, with their customers as well. I, I caution that kind of work, though, with the, um, with the Henry Ford kind of thing. If you ask people what did they want, they want a faster horse. It's not, you know, like you ask a person who's using gas, what do you want? I want cheaper gas. You know, it's, and it's actually for the, the hot water, you know, in reality, people just want steady hot water that, Probably not as as best at a, in either electricity or gas. I don't have any particular reason why you would be, but electrical appliances are a little more expensive now in some things. For the for the heating, you know, people oh, a huge number of people have both. They have gas and they have um, electric. They just don't know that their air conditioner is there. It could be a heater as well. Um, cooking seems to be one. Uh, you know, very passionate people cook. Really, it's something's right in front of you, and I think that's one engagement with gas where people you know it, it's the gas they want to see and that they want to experience and they want on on their on their food you know conversely there are there are other people who are you know equally passionate about um induction and, and i must say i'm in an accidental kind of an induction system and when we moved house and we built a house about six or seven years ago i'm not even sure how it got there it certainly wasn't a conscious decision of mine i think it was the clean sleek lines but uh children having grown up with induction when we a few years ago went to a, to a holiday rental and had gas you know my my younger daughter was about 15 at the time and I came up to me rather sheepishly and said like am I doing this right I've had the pot on for ages and it hasn't boiled and I went over and it's all burning along fine because you know again gas was the fastest way to boil Water until you got induction, and the difference between gas and induction is like the difference between the oven and the microwave. Um, you need a huge amount of patience to, to cook with gas if you're used to cooking induction. So, I'd say, yeah, going back to your question, people like their gas. That, that you know will be a matter for the play out in consumer markets, and be crazy as a government to try and predict what people are going to want to put in their house. But there are some really good products on on our side. All of them need to be more efficient. Um, you know, the high efficiency um, hot water seems a, a low engagement sort of thing and should be able to be done with heat pumps. Heating and cooling has a real 
conviction about it and cooking is something that people are probably more passionate about one way or the other. Yeah, Tony, could I come in, yes, I come yes, in quickly yes, on this yes. as well? People's willingness is often influenced by their capability as well. So it's sort of one thing, I think, to survey, you know, people who uh, who say, yeah, you know, I'd be willing to switch because I was going to renovate the kitchen this week anyway, or this year anyway, and I've got the spare cash in order to buy the induction cooktop or, or that sort of stuff versus people who don't have any spare cash or who rent their homes um, or who live in public housing, although I think Victoria has made probably more effort than a lot of other states to address that issue around public housing. Um, and so we also need to think about those people. It's that the people who will, you know, be at the vanguard are the people who are happy to switch, but then there's a whole group of people who, for whatever reason, will find it very hard to switch. And so policy needs to kind of look after those people as well and make sure that they're not locked into something that's actually more expensive for them in the long term. Yeah, I guess the uh, that raises the point that um, Matt was talking about earlier, I guess, is that if people who, who either can or know more because they realise that right now I'd actually be probably financially better off if I'd moved over from gas to electricity and I've got other reasons why I want to renovate my kitchen or whatever um, and do it. Now, what then happens, of course, is you start to get that, um, what Matt described as a death spiral, where basically there's fewer and fewer people on the gas network, which still has to be paid for, and that gets quite a nasty problem. Um, and so I guess we are keeping, you know, looking at those things which um, we do today and not getting in the way of those, and at some point, do you end up having to get in the way? Does the government, does, is, there, is it a role for government? Or, you know, given the sector is largely in the hands of private uh, companies who sell gas and distribute gas, and whose problem is it? I mean, you know, in the end, it's everybody's problem and it probably will be a, an issue for government in the future. But right now, there's so much uncertainty when you think about it. Is it going to be a hydrogen switchover? Is it going to be electrification and things? There is a lot of space for the market and, and, and innovation to go on to do it. And, and as has been mentioned in terms of, you know, regulation and innovation in terms of how you know, businesses operate themselves to bring the costs through the depreciation thing. The point that Alison made, I think, also is really, you know, important. Maybe we don't, you know, at the moment, you know, some gas users really pay quite a high premium to support others. You know, if you're a, because we have a declining block tariff, if you're that customer who just uses a huge amount of electricity, a huge amount of gas in winter, you're probably putting a lot more cost on the system, but you're not actually for if you're that customer that just has a gas cooktop, you're probably paying way more than the relative proportion of the cost share. And maybe there'll be innovations in tariff models that you know keep, you know, create an incentive for some people who will want to stay on that, to stay on it, to avoid you know the, the spoil. But it, I mean I get really it is really a tricky question about the what, who's responsible for these things because it's almost like in one sense it's is it a regulatory Ponzi scheme to just say, oh, we've got to keep people on so that the cost for everyone and everyone's less well off, but the costs for everyone are less bad than otherwise? Or is it a form of like it is tricky where a market economy and and people you know, are entitled to make those choices that actually, you know, I don't want, you know, I want to choose this one, I want to choose that one. And they're very tricky questions, but hopefully we're on the conversation. And it's a big thing to turn around with millions of consumers there's lots of uncertainty about you know maybe but there's no like it cannot be written off that in the 2030s hydrogen is really low cost and we do do a, a switch and there are maybe other uses for hydrogen in houses that people haven't thought of yet you know like it's maybe it's heat pump um, no, maybe there's hydrogen heat pumps maybe there's um uh, fuel cells i mean who knows and hydrogen cut like there's it's too early to make those calls what people need to have is support and information to make the right choice to avoid lock-ins, and you know the, the system is is developed in a way that recognises that uncertainty. We're not, you know, just willy-nilly growing it in places that will take forty or fifty years to 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 pay off. Um, there's, you know, we're in a measured transition across all of those factors because you know Ukraine has taught us one thing: like, you know, it, there's no. We, I say those cost savings. Are there for consumers, but that was in a world where gas was not forty dollars a gigawatt. I mean, net back. If it ever gets, like fifteen now, if it ever gets anywhere near that, all sorts of things could happen. Really, yeah. 
And, you know, I think that, that, that um, what you put your finger on, Ralph, is that um, there are things we just don't know, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore them forever. Hopefully, the more we talk about this and the more people understand what's going on, and in particular, they understand their choices, that they often are making, one way or the other, they are making choices, even if it's to replace your old gas or water system with a new gas or water system, you've then got yourself a new piece of um, capital investment in your home that's going to be there for another 10 or 15 years. And we don't, you know, if people keep making those decisions, then we're obviously, as you say, locking in a problem. But equally moving away from that without thinking through the issues is going to be hard. So it seems to me that um, there's, this is a very, one of the trickiest issues about the transition to a low emission economy that we've got in this country. Um, we've got a, because of our history of gas, um, we've got um, a supply issue, which has been, we've talked about in terms of meeting certain demand at certain times of the year. Um, some of our supplies run out or has, is in the process of rapidly running out. But equally, we have some people for various reasons who still depend upon gas. So matching those up is not trivial. And I guess the point of this webinar this afternoon was not just to yes, it is, but there are some issues emerging already that we know about. Um, the more people at least understand what the issues are, the better informed they're going to be. I don't think anyone's going to make the perfect decision, but hopefully if this webinar has shed a little bit of light on that, will have been successful. Um, both the, the work of the government here in Victoria, but other states who are also grappling with their own version of this, um, the work of the of AEMO and the federal government are all very relevant and we can be critical or otherwise, but that this as hopefully what you've understood those who are listening to this, this is not a simple problem with a simple answer. This is quite an important challenge. And um, if you think that's been useful, then um, thank you for joining our webinar. Um, if you think having us doing this is a good idea, then please uh, consider supporting Grattan financially. Uh, there's stuff on our website. Some of you may already be supporters of Grattan. Um, we certainly appreciate that because hopefully one of our roles is, is both to talk about policy, but also to inform and educate people about what the hell's going on in what is quite a complex challenge for the next, as Alice was 20 or 30 years. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you for um, the ring rose that helped set this up. And finally, thank you to the, uh, my, uh, the panelists, um, Ralph Griffith, Matthew Cremau, and Alison Reeve. And uh, we look forward to talking to you at the next uh, Grattan Energy and Climate Change webinar. And maybe we'll have one of these in person in the not too distant future. Thank you.